Good evening. Um, I want to uh, say a special thanks again to the Avon Theater, um, who has been a great partner um, to the film festival uh, since our beginning. Um, and um, we're so, uh, we feel so blessed to be able to uh, show this film here um, this evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, and I'd like to welcome um, to the stage for this Q&A, Q um, Julianne Green. Um, Julianne received her Master's of Social Work with Concentration in Community Partnerships from Georgia State University. Uh, she is with the Family Centers, and she's been with the Family Centers since 2019 as the manager of the Den of Grief and Support. Uh, the Den is a two-part grief and bereavement program for ages three into adulthood. The Den has an evening family bereavement component in addition to school-based support groups. Julianne also serves on the Family Center's trauma response team, responding to deaths and crises in the Fairfield County communities. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, to welcome Aaron Keyes. Aaron is an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church, um, and she has led congregations in Manhattan, Greenwich, and Washington, D.C. She is a graduate of Elon University with a Bachelor of Arts in Religious Studies and a Columbia Theology Seminary with a Master's of Divinity. Aaron's education also includes extensive training in clinical pastoral care and family systems theory, representing her lifelong interest in human healing and flourishing. Aaron is a published author and a skilled public speaker, having been a guest preacher and lecturer. Um, she has been featured on C-SPAN in her role as guest chaplain for the US House of Representatives, and in 2020 was named one of the 40 under 40 women in Washington. So welcome, ladies, and thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, we had, um, we were so excited to have you here and thought that this was such an incredibly powerful film, um, that even though we did not have, um, the director here, the film is going to be released, uh, wide at the end of the week and they have a, a packed press junket. Um, but first of all, let's give a, a little bit of a round of applause. That is a directorial debut, which I think is absolutely incredible from Fran, um, Kratz. Uh, but I wanted to, I thought this uh, this film just really demanded kind of a conversation afterwards. And, um, you know, what I, what I thought was so incredible about the film was that even though this was a very specific story, it kind of told a general story of grief. And, um, you know, as human beings, all of us are going to go through grief in some capacity. And um, I think it, it's maybe our most important lesson we're going to learn as human beings is how to how to get through that to the other side. Um, and this is your all's specialty. So um, I just wanted people to know, you know, that, that there is support in this community. And um, uh, what would you say if somebody finds themselves in a traumatic situation after the loss of a parent or a child or a friend, what are some of the first steps you recommend they take? Okay, um, I think the first step for someone to take when they've experienced a traumatic loss is to try to remind themselves or surround themselves with people who can remind them that they're going to be in shock. So you, your body might take over, your mind might take over and you'll find yourself performing um, tasks. You kind of just go on automatic but uh, it's really good to surround yourself with people during that time, people who can remind you to drink water, to eat, to sleep, uh, just, to, just to help keep you regulated, really. Um, so just sort of remembering, I've just experienced in a traumatic event, I'm in shock, and then trying to have those really close people to support you. Uh, Julianne? Um, I think in addition to having those people around you to support you, also having those people look for community resources for you. So whether that's your place of worship, um, a nonprofit such as family centers, um, any other community, communal support, re, <laughs> supports that they can find for you can be really helpful as well. Um, it's not always the family that's been impacted who's reaching out to us in those immediate um, you know, hours, days, weeks. Um, after a traumatic loss or death. It's often those really close family members or friends that are helping kind of build that team to continue to surround that family or those people. Thank you. Um, are there stages to grief? 
uh, and healing and could you expand upon them? I know we always mm -hmm. try to put something into a box, like if I can just get through steps one, two, three, mm -hmm. but is there kind of a general outline that you know can, can kind of give people hope in these situations? Yeah, I think, so it's, it's in, this is one of the things that I always share when folks come to us for grief support is Elizabeth Kubler-Ross created the five stages of grief. She actually created them for the people who were dying and who were going through the end stages and phases of life. These stages were not created for the people left behind in the wake of these deaths and losses. Um, so it, it's a bit unrealistic to think that we're going to go through these five stages and cycles um, uh, kind of in this clear-cut line. I think the stages exist, but we ebb and flow out of them, um, and we will forever. I mean, I feel like in this film, they hit all the stages of grief mm -hmm. just within their one conversation. Um, so, you know, I, I do think we like to put things in a box and really define things. Um, it makes it easier, right? It makes it easier to manage and to wrap our minds around, but giving ourselves the grace to keep moving through the cycles over and over, and maybe we're in one cycle for longer than we anticipated, is just really important to be aware of. Well, and grief is not a linear process, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that happened when we sort of had these five stages layered on top of it is people began to think you move through them in some sort of linear fashion, mm -hmm. and, and you don't. Uh, at the Center for Hope and Renewal, we have a grief specialist on staff, and she works with people individually. She also hosts grief groups, and she talks about there not being so much these stages of grief, but the tasks of grief. Mm -hmm. So those are tasks that we undertake in the grieving process, things like allowing ourselves to feel the pain. I mean, we really saw that in the movie just now when they were reliving the events that their children went through. Uh, another task of grief is deciding how you're going to remember the person that you lost. We saw that in the movie as well as, as I mean, those really powerful scenes where the parents are, are bringing these memories up and, and allowing the memories to stand for themselves. So these tasks of grief allow us to, I think, have a little bit more freedom and experience grief as it comes rather than trying to fit it into some sort of process that it, it really just won't fit into. Yeah, that, that goes into my next question, which was it, see, it did seem like a very important aspect in the parents' journey um, towards healing that they were able to share pictures of both their children, uh, both the shooter and the victim. Um, and it seemed that they had this visceral need to, to hold on to memory. Um, how can we honor the memories of those we have lost and not let that overwhelm us? Because, you know, in, in avoiding the, the most painful part of the grieving process, um, you know, avoidance is not the answer, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. hard to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I can share a little bit about what we do at the Den really specific to, to this question and kind of what we saw in the film. Um, the Den for Grieving Kids is a family bereavement program, so we have groups from ages three all the way into adulthood for all different types of loss. And our two main events that we have are our memory meal, where our families cook their loved one's favorite meal, and they bring it in, this was of course pre-COVID, but for a potluck-style dinner, and they're able to share a photo of their loved one, their favorite meal, and just really open up this conversation that they aren't typically able to have with folks about their loved one. Um, you know, if you bring up that your child died, often people aren't going to ask you follow-up questions because they're uncomfortable. And so you're in this really loving and open space where you can just share about your loved one exactly what we were saying earlier and the way that you wish to remember them. We also have our commemoration ceremony where we display the loved one's photos and light a candle in remembrance. And so being able to put a face to these names that we hear about so often in group um, is really, really impactful and, and so powerful and something we were able to do even during COVID as well. Yeah, I think the way that we honor the memories of those we've lost is by honoring the ways in which we need to remember them. And that's going to look different for everyone. Some people are going to want to have the pictures out. Some people are not. Uh, I remember when my mom lost her mother, 
uh, suddenly a lot of my grandmother's furniture started showing up in our house. And um, as a child, I didn't understand it. And I thought, do we really need all these extra end tables around? And um, But my that was a very important part of my mom's healing process, was to bring those things into our home and to have her mother with us in that way. And so I think if we can honor our process, that's the best way we can honor their memory. Great. Um, in the past few years, neuroscience has really come to the forefront in complementing mindfulness and the necessity for us to kind of sit, um, sit again through, through these feelings. Um, there's no way to navig navigate around it. Um, what, what are some other coping tools that you recommend people incorporate into their lives to help, to help them find peace? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm obviously a big advocate of grief support groups. That's such a big part of our programming, but it's just really amazing, especially when we have our groups with our younger kids, um, being able to see their situation reflected back to them within those groups. Because as they mentioned in the film, grief can be so incredibly isolating. So for kids to be able to be together and see other kids who have lost a sibling or a parent is just really important to their healing process. And same with our parents and those who have lost a spouse that are in our groups. It's really important to see that mirrored um, with the other folks in their group and to be around people where they can speak openly without folks getting uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I think it's really, for me, therapy and, and group work is, is really important. And I'm a big believer in uh, using the body to help heal the mind and heart and soul. And particularly when it comes to really difficult emotions or experiences, they can often get lodged within our body. And so there's a lot of healing potential in movement, uh, whatever that looks like for someone, whether it's going for a run, stretching, even just sitting and breathing intentionally can help release some of the emotional residue that can sometimes get stuck within us. Yeah. Um, one of them, there were a lot of powerful moments in the film, but um, I thought it was very, um, uh, one of the most powerful moments was when um, Gail was demanding answers from Ann Dowd's character, Linda, about how her son became a murderer. Um, I don't think there are concrete answers, but there were moments in his life, the moving, the social isolation, and the school, um, uh, where one can't help but wonder if he received the support he needed, could the situation have been avoided? Um, what are the things that we can do to support our children as they navigate change through situations like this? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to lean on those communal supports that I mentioned earlier. Um, I know in the movie they said that the school social workers and the school staff kind of couldn't be bothered, but I think now we're moving in a really different direction with that. And so I would recommend parents reaching out to school support staff and school social workers and really cluing them in and allowing the child to be um, you know, a part of that as well and, and give them a little say in that. Um, but really looping people in and kind of getting those wraparound services going because we can't, we can't do it alone. We kind of have to do it as a community and be able to support these kids and children from all different aspects and different directions. And I would say that modeling healthy mental health practices is a really important example to set for our children. Um, I think sometimes the tendency is to wait until an issue arises and presents itself and then kind of usher the kid off into therapy. And I think it's much better for the family unit and for the child if the parents are modeling what good mental health looks like, whether in the conversations that they have at home or in the mental health practices that they that they have in their own lives and speaking openly about that. Uh, at the Center for Hope and Renewal, we don't believe that you have to be in crisis before you can take care of your mental health, uh, particularly as we look at where our society is right now. We're coming out of this pandemic and we're all having um, a much more open conversation about the importance of caring for our mental well-being. So I think the more that we can talk about that, the more that we can destigmatize that for our kids, we're gonna make it easier for them to ask for help when they need it or ideally before they need it. Yeah, I love that piece around modeling because so often children won't even allow themselves to begin that grieving process because they're worried about how they're gonna make their parent feel. So if their parent is being really, I mean, as open as is appropriate about their process and their therapeutic um, work or they're going to a support group and that child can see that grief and that, um, 
you know, that inner work being modeled for them, they'll be more open to receiving support as well. Because as I mentioned, it's really isolating as a kid to potentially be the only one in therapy or the only one going to a grief group after school. Um, so being able to see your parents doing that is, is really helpful. Um, well, I wanted to um, uh, give anyone in the audience a chance um, to ask questions if they like. First of all, I, I just want to thank you all again for all the great work you are doing in our community, and um, um, and and for you all to know that they are resources that are that are here and available um, if you know of anybody who um, you know who's in crisis. Um, so I'm I'm so grateful that that you all are right here in our backyard. Do we have any questions? So you're talking about the grief, but the mental health issue is so much bigger. I mean, how to get these children to before they cause grief? Um, and I think today's men, in this area, I work in a high school, and the mental illness is beyond. And since we're now into a cuddling time, you don't discipline. Well, how does that make you feel? Um, it really doesn't work. So how do you deal with the mental health when we really aren't dealing with it? Social workers, family centers, they're so overwhelmed. They have so many cases and so few workers. And it really doesn't pay to go into special ed. It doesn't pay to be a social worker. Now they're saying psychologists are the lowest paying. And they're advising kids, I have a kid in college, do not become a psychologist. You're gonna make $40,000 a year. So how do you deal with mental health to avoid these situations when there's there's no supports out there? The supports are dwindling. Good luck that's with that one. We're dealing yeah, with it that's too. a tough big question. question. It's a big one, but you know, there's. I feel like working in the mental health field. I, I feel like there's actually more supports out there, especially during COVID. Um, you know. You mean within the school specifically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think finding the right fit with a social worker or a therapist is, is really the first step. I mean, there's going to be kids who they might not find a right fit with a therapist until the second or third try. It's really hard to get them to keep going and keep trying, but I think there is a good fit out there. Um, as far as services within the community, I, I don't think they're dwindling. I think right now we're really busy, but so many agency agencies have risen to the occasion and had been able to expand services and get really creative with their services. You know, we were able to move our entire program to this virtual format, and we were shocked to see that ages 10 into uh, the teenage years and young adults were actually taking the most advantage of our of our services. So I, I don't mean to dismiss the question by any means, but I think within family centers and our program and with our uh, counseling services as well, we're seeing a little bit of a, a different trend when it comes to that. Uh, yeah, the question that you're asking is a complicated one. There's no, you know, what, one easy answer. It's going to sum it up. I mean, I think advocacy is a big part of this, um, making mental health. I mean, like I said, it is becoming much more part of the conversation we're having as a society, but continuing to push it out there as something that we don't need to be afraid of. We don't need to, you know, push into the corners and act like isn't happening and, and act like isn't something that we all deal with. You know, maybe you're not dealing with it today, but you probably will soon or at some point in your lifetime. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, I could say a lot more about that. But uh, so how do we normalize it? How do we make it acceptable to talk about? How do we teach our children to talk about it from an early age? Kind of like I was saying earlier. I mean, I think it's all about just continuing to have the conversation. And even after the pandemic's over and we go into whatever in the world waits for us after this, you know, not letting the importance of our mental health kind of fall by the wayside as we resume life as normal. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. Thank you. Um, anybody else? I just want to compliment you all. I do want to let you know, I'm Louisa Green here at the Avon. As a former social worker, I have been so overwhelmed by the wonderful response of the Stanford and Greenwich Police Departments since the pandemic started in dealing with some of the mental health issues that the teacher just commented on. There was a terrible tragedy right in front of where I live in Old Greenwich of a student who died, senior at West Hill. The principal at West Hill, within 24 hours, was working with the Stanford Youth Department at the police and in the Greenwich Youth Department at the police to get um, you know, help for the, for the other students that were involved that witnessed this terrible tragedy. It's a different type of tragedy that was in the movie, but nonetheless, a terrible death. And to ensure that these kids get counseling for what they witnessed and probably what they'll have to endure in the police investigation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so many ramifications of what we saw tonight but I just want to point out the critical importance and the blessing that we have. People don't think of youth departments at the police as helpful, but they are, and they want to, and they have a lot more officers who are going for postgraduate mental health training. So I just wanted to point that out. Thanks, Louisa. Anybody else? All right, well, I wanna just um, thank you again, ladies. And um, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the uh, Mr. Rogers quote, which is look for the helpers, because I think there is a lot, um, there's a lot we can feel overwhelmed about. Um, and you know, there, it's, it's, it's hard to stop these things from happening. If, if any of us knew the answer, I think we'd, we'd all do it. So um, thank you for helping. Thank um, you for having us. Thank you.